Take your Bibles and turn to, like to thank our visitors for coming. And make sure our visitors are welcome. We're glad to have you with us. I know we've got several visitors here this morning. It's glad to have you with us. All right. Um, take your Bible and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10, one hand, and then 1 Kings chapter 15 in the other. 1 Samuel chapter 10. I want to pick up verse 9. 1 Samuel 10, 9. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart and all those signs that came to pass that day. This is 1 Samuel 10, 9. Did I tell the verse? 1 Samuel 10, 9. This is talking about Saul. Verse 10, And when they came hither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets, then the people said one to another, What is this that has come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same place answered and said, Who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? It was a surprise to those that were around that Saul started prophesying, the son of Kish. It's like, who is this guy's father? Isn't it Kish? Uh, I mean, you, you kind of, I'm narrating a little bit. Isn't this Kish's son, Saul? We know who his father is. Who, who is his father? I like to preach like father, like son this morning. Like father, like son. Uh, take your Bible and turn to 1 Kings chapter 15. 1 Kings chapter 15. 1 Kings chapter 15. And look at verse 3. Who is his father? You know, to identify a man, many a times we want to know who their father is, who their mother is, what's the genealogy, why do we do that? Why? Because the characteristics of the father many times will come down through the children. And the influence that we have on our children are tremendous. Many a times they pick up our characteristics. Some of them are lucky enough to pick up our looks. And, uh, and then that's a, whoa, what a blessing. Sorry, son. I mean, that's, you know. Uh, look at 1 Kings chapter 15. Look at verse 3. And he walked in all the sins of his father. Boy, that's a bad thing to pick up. Which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Now this is on down the genealogy of David. And he's got two fathers to compare. His great granddaddy David, whose heart was perfect to the Lord. Well, he wasn't like that. But he walked in all the sins of his father, his immediate father. Uh, he had kind of grown away from the example that David had set. Now, I will say this. When it comes to you giving an account of your sins at the judgment, you give account for your sins, not your father's. Okay? But preaching to fathers, I want you to see the great influence that you can have on those around you, and especially your children. Like father, like son. Like father, like son. And uh, many a times we will say that statement because we will see the character of the father in the children. Many a times we'll see that. Man, you, I, I met a guy that knew my dad. Well, is Mike Wenzel. He's going to be preaching the revival for us. And uh, when I got, I'd never met the guy before, and we were going to stay at his church when Simona got her green card interview. And uh, we got to his church, and I stepped out. Now, this guy knew my dad way back when before dad ever moved to Tennessee 
long before I was a twinkling in my parents' eyes. And uh, my dad was his Sunday school director, or his youth group director, rather, and uh, way back when they were young. And uh, Brother Wenzel saw me when I stepped there. He says, man, you look just like your father. You, you look just like your dad. I didn't think I really looked like my dad, but apparently he did. And I do look at some of his dad's younger pictures, and I can see myself in them, me and my brothers. But, uh, but my question is, is, do I act like my dad? And uh, my dad did some crazy things, but he was a good example as a father. No, I do not moonwalk down the grocery style with the uh, grocery cart trying to embarrass my kids. My dad would do that. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> okay. There's some ways you're lucky I don't act like your grandpa did. He lived to embarrass his kids. That's what he would, he lived for that. And uh, he would do some things. But uh, like father, like son, I mean, there was some characteristics that my dad had that I hope came down to me. To me. Uh, my dad, I considered him a righteous man. I considered him a man with a good work ethic, one that provided, one that loved his family, one that was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, one that would study the word of God, one that tried to live by it. I have a good heritage with my father, and it's not one that I have to be embarrassed about. Not everybody is so privileged. Not everybody has a good father, a physical father. But you get saved, thank God you got a heavenly father, that you can be like. And you can break the mold or you can break the trend or the string of lineage of sin and you can change some things. You know, Josiah had one of the most evil grandfathers that there was, Manasseh. And he changed things. Amen? Josiah was a great king. You can change things. You don't have to follow the lineage that comes down. But many times we see that the child becomes like the father or picks up the characteristics of the father. I want to point out some things in the Bible that I see with certain sons, how the father set an example that they should have followed. And these are good characteristics. Sin's easy to follow. You don't have to train up a child in the wrong way he should go. Why? Because that comes naturally and has since Adam. Okay? You don't need to train them that way. You need to train them in the right way. Okay? You need to train them in a godly way. You need to teach them what's right. And you need to teach them what's wrong and not to do the wrong. Okay? Uh, first example I'd like to see in the Bible is a certain man named Gideon. And Gideon tries to set example and train his son. And the first thing I want to say, as a father, we need to set an example of manhood. An example of manhood. Uh, one of the things I want for my sons is I want them to be men when they grow up. Yeah, I mean, yes, I want them to be godly men. But I also want them to be men. When they grow up, I want them to act like a man, conduct themselves like a man. And in this generation, that, that's pretty important. Uh, there's a lacking in manhood these days, real manhood. Take your Bible, learn that judge, turn to Judges chapter 8, verse 18. It says, Then said, Now Gideon had just took 300 men. Obeyed the Lord, followed the Lord through in the commandments they gave, scared the wits out of 200,000 plus, I think. Uh, I, I should have went back and refreshed my memory. I think it's 200 plus soldiers. And, uh, they took, and God takes and takes 300 men following Gideon, scares these guys where they turn on themselves, they're slaying each other, they run, and then he's pursuing the last remnant of that bunch. 
Now, you, you can say, well, God was in it and he did some great miracles with Gideon. Let me tell you, for any man to take 300 and follow those instructions, it doesn't matter if God was talking to him or not. That took some faith and that took some guts. And it took a man to do what Gideon did. To even go and attempt what he did. And then he's, fle- he's pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna. In verse eight, in Judges 8, verse 18, it says, Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmunna, What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. Now Gideon was not a child of a king, physically, was he? But he resembled the child of a king. Let me ask you something. Do you resemble a child of a king? Say, what king would that be? Well, we have a king we should be resembling. That we should be a child. Lord Jesus Christ. We should resemble him. We should be like him. Verse 19, and he said, that They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if ye had saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said unto Jether, his firstborn, Up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared, because he was yet a youth. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou and fall upon us. For as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon rose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's neck. Now the question is, here's this young man that's Gideon's son. And he's got him out there in the battle with him. And it doesn't say how old he is. Maybe he was 13, maybe he was 14. Maybe he was 18, but it says he was but a youth. And Gideon was growing up in a time of war. They were fighting. I mean, he just had to fight a couple hundred thousand with 300 following the Lord's order. They're in time of war. At that time, war was not a long-distance war. It was up and personal with the sword. And he had his firstborn out there with him, saying, okay, I'm going to make a man out of you. You're going to take a sword. I want you to kill these kings. We would consider that mental torture of the youth today. But you live in a different time. You live in a different time. So, all right, this is to prepare you for life. You're going to have a life of war. Go and fight. Now, did he have a life of war? Sure. His brother kills all of them. Him and his brothers. You know, Gideon's son... Only two of Gideon's sons survive because one of them kills all his other brethren. He lived in a rough time. Gideon was trying to prepare him for something. What is he trying to do? He's trying to teach his son to be a man. He's trying to teach his son to be a man. You know, for some youth, some young men, the best thing they can do is join the military. Why? So it can make a man out. So it can make a man out. Well, at least that's the way it used to be. I don't know about the military today, but that's the way it used to be. And uh, and uh, I thank God. I mean, I grew up the way I did. I mean, we were taught to be men. I mean, uh, my dad would put the gloves on, and we were in martial arts. He was a black belt and stuff, and, and we'd go at it. And, and he taught me how to take a punch. Why? Because if I stepped into his punch, I took the punch. Okay, and he taught me that. My brothers taught me that. I mean, we were up, Tom, and we did things that you probably shouldn't do. And had a few ER visits. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> that many. But, uh, I mean, we, we learned how to endure a little bit of pain. You know, through the Christian life, you're going to have to endure some stuff. But you know what my dad also taught me as far as being a man? To stand up for the things of God and not be ashamed. Which is a little bit more important to have a spiritual toughness than just a physical toughness. 
If you have a spiritual toughness, I will be a happy father. Now, I know I can't make you physically tough. That's something you have to do to yourself. It's brutal. (laughs) But uh, but, uh, at least be spiritually tough. I remember at a young age, my dad would take me out. He'd put a bunch of tracks in my hand and says, okay, good. We'd go, and where I grew up in Columbia, Tennessee, every year in the spring in April, they had what, call, what they called Mule Day Parade. And we lived along close to the town we lived in was near the Natchez Trace. The Natchez Trace was a big, um, back in the frontier days, was a big route to the Mississippi River, which was the route to the west. And it was big on trading in that area of mules. Well, that festival grew in Columbia, Tennessee, and Mule Day Parade is a huge thing there. People all from the south bring their mules to Columbia, Tennessee. Then they ride through town, and they have mules everywhere. They have parades, and there's probably about 200,000-plus people that comes into Columbia, Tennessee for to ride their mules through the streets. Okay? Big Southern Festival. (laughs) All right? But we would take that opportunity, and Dad would buy a whole bunch of chick tracks. And we'd take them tracks, and we'd go out, and we'd pass out gospel tracks. And he taught us to do that from a very young age. We'd get ahead. And and, and us kids, we were glad because, I mean, we got, it was kind of a contest. We could out-give any adult. The adults go up to the bikers trying to give them a, Jake Craig, get out of here with that. But a little six, seven-year-old kid, hey, can I give you something? Oh, yes, sir, thank you, thank you. At least that's the way it used to be. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, if I, if I wanted to really get in a door, door knock, and I take a small child with me, at least they're polite then, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, they're, they're a little bit more polite. But, I mean, that's, that's kind of uh, what you see. And he taught us to do that. Then he'd go out on the street corner, he'd hold sign, and he'd take a blow horn, and he'd preach to people on the street. Quote scriptures to them. They'd cuss them, they'd holler at them. You know what I learned as a kid? Maybe not so much the correct way of winning souls, but I learned not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You say, you see me get saved straight preaching? No. But I know this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It doesn't matter to me what people think about me proclaiming the gospel of Christ. My dad taught me that. He taught me that through street preaching. Now, I remember dad would sit on, we would take and go through Walmart after church service on a Sunday night. All the young people of the town would get in well, I, I don't know if it was Walmart. It was Red Foods was the grocery store. But back then they had what they called uh, parking lot parties. And what the young youths would do in the town is they'd get all their cars in a circle out on the outer circle of the grocery store in the parking lot. And they'd get in that circle and they'd be blaring their music and sit on their hoods and dancing in the circle or doing whatever. That was their party in the town. Okay, that's what they did. And uh, Dad would take and uh, get on the back side. See, we had, uh, he had bought this Ford F-150, put some benches in the back, threw us all, all us kids in the back. There were seven of us because we obey. we had this seatbelt safety laws then, I guess. <laughs> and uh, he had this big camper and he'd throw us all in the back. And uh, man... You hit a pothole, you bouncing around, everything in the back. We didn't have no seat belts. I, I don't know what they, I mean, the different, I'm not that old, but we lived differently when I grew up. I and mean, we used to, I mean, we had, uh, there were six kids when I was, I was the youngest of six, and then Hannah came five years later, she was the baby. But there were six of us. I remember we used to do what's called, how many of you know what Pinto is? Pinto. It's a little tiny hatchback car. We would do what's called pack the pinto. And uh, car seat, my sister's lap was my car seat. <laughs> I mean, that was, uh, that was a car seat. That's the way we grew up. Okay? 
Hey, you say they'd arrest you. Yeah, they probably would. (laughs) But anyways, long story short, getting off of my childhood, my dad would get up on that F-150 with that camper, and we'd be in the back. And he had this blow horn. And he'd get up there with that blow horn, and Mom would drive the truck. And we'd come in, he'd go grocery shopping, he'd come out, he'd get his blow horn, get on the back of the truck, right on the bumper. Mom would drive, and they'd go up to all them teens with their circle, and it was like the Indian circle and the cowboys with their wagon circle. He'd watch them around, repent or perish, turn or burn. <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, I get out of here. You know what my... Jesus saves. And he just started giving them the gospel. And we'd circle on that car. you say, that's crazy. My dad was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. My dad wasn't ashamed. You know, so I take my kids out on the street corner. And they drive by and say, why are them guys out there on the street corner quoting scripture? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I don't want them to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I don't want them to be ashamed of it. I'm not trying to stir up trouble, but I want to lead by an example. You know, Jesus Christ was a street preacher. Every disciple was a street preacher. They didn't just stay in the church building. They went out house to house. They went out on the streets. They dealt with people on the streets. Why? Because they won't come in here. They don't come in here today. I mean, I've been preaching here 10 years. Let me tell you, they don't come in here. They don't. You got to go to them. You got to go to them. Now, there is a presentation where you have to present it the right way. You want people to know that you actually have a burden for their soul. Amen? I mean, you're not just sitting there trying to browbeat your house spiritually. I've watched people do that. Yeah, that's the wrong way to go about it. But you shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You have to show them to be a man. It's important that young people see what it means to be a man and to take abuse from the world. You know, as a Christian, you take abuse at work all the time. You take abuse from the lost all the time. They try to push your buttons all the time. And you can't let it bother you. You got to learn to take it. And take it, and take it, and take it. And, uh, and they'll push you on that. Jesus Christ showed the example of manhood. During his crucifixion, there's a great testimony that's given to Jesus Christ by a soldier. And that soldier was Pilate. You know what Pilate says? It says in John 19, 1 through 5, it says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe, and he said, Hell, king of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. Behold the man. I'll tell you, there was something about Jesus Christ that impressed that Roman soldier. He looked at Jesus Christ and says, Yeah, there's something different about him. You teach your children to be men. As a father, we need to lead examples. I'll tell you, the next one I see is do we teach them what's right? I, I mean, I've, I've read about some lost men. They win that Congressional Medal of Honor. They do some amazing things, and they're lost. And I sit there, I read them stories about these soldiers that go through these enduring, terrible things. Tough, just as tough as nails. And I say, how does a lost man have the character to do that? How does that lost man have that character? And if you only teach your children how to be men, and you don't teach them what's right and wrong, well, he's liable to be a Genghis Khan or something else. 
okay? So you got to also teach them what's right. I find a father, when the Lord talks about him, says he's a man that will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. That's Abraham. In Genesis 18, 17 through 19, it says, And the Lord says, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. What a testimony. I, I, I hope that someday when my children are older, and have gone their own separate ways, they can say, yeah, Dad commanded us in what was right. He taught us right from wrong. I, I mean, I look at this generation today, my generation, and those that are coming up after. And my kids' generation, oh, Lord help us. Uh, did anybody ever teach them what's right and wrong? I mean, today it seems like society thinks wrong is right and right is wrong. They have it backwards. I mean, you couldn't go out and teach somebody morality. Why? Because society teaches that's wickedness to teach them morality. And to say something's wrong, God forbid. <laughs> I mean, uh, but... Abraham taught his tip, commanded his children and his whole household after him what is right and wrong. I, I kind of like that he commanded his children. I know him that he will command his children. That's what it says. It says, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. But you live in under my roof, you're going to do what's right. You ain't got a choice. Sorry to use you for example as Father's Day. <laughs> but, uh, you know. But, but you get the idea. You know, when you're 18, you can live by your own roof just outside of my house. <laughs> I mean, you, as long as you're under my roof, you live by my rules. That's a command. Joshua didn't say, me and my, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's, that is what Joshua said. He did not say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord if they want to or only until they turn 18. I mean, that's, a, that's not what he said. Well, I want them to grow up making their own choices in life. You can make your choices in life after you're out of the house. Till then, you do what I tell you. I mean, period. I mean, it commands his house. There's rules in the house. Okay? Now, I, I do want you to grow up knowing how to make your own choices, so I'll make you make, I'll allow you to make some mistakes and learn from them. You, you got to do that with kids too sometimes, you know. That's going to hurt you, that's going to hurt you. All right, I'm not going to warn you this time. Ah, yeah, I told you <laughs> it was going to hurt you. I mean, that's, sometimes it's that way. Sometimes it's that way. You know, uh, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, Solomon is trying to instruct his son. He says, My son, hear the instructions of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. You know, 23 times in the book of Proverbs we find the phrase, My son, my son, my son. What's he doing? He's instructing them what's right and what's wrong. And, and that's exactly what Proverbs is. He gives them the wicked man and the righteous man, the fool and the wise man. He gives them right and wrong. He shows them both sides. This is what's wrong. This is what's right. Why don't we have that today? You say, it's not everything's black and white. Yeah, it is. They just don't make it black and white anymore. But it's still black and white. It's right, it's wrong. Amen? I was taught that shade area is called wrong. Little white light is a lie. 
<laughs> That's what I was taught. There's no in between there. It's right or it's wrong. Okay. You say, how do I know it's right? It's right. Anything else is wrong that goes against it. Right. All right. Teach them what's right and wrong. I got to hurry up here. Thirdly, if you want to lead by example, if you want to be like father, like son, you want to be not just a man, but not just a man that knows right from wrong, but a man that's a man of God. A man of God. It's one thing to be a man. It's another thing to be a man of God. A man of God is one that takes God's side, promotes God, does what God asks him to do, and always puts God in the forefront of his life because he's a servant of God. Oh, that we could influence our kids to be men of God, and not just our kids, but all those around us that we influence. When I look at what Elisha says about Elijah, the prophet that he follows, it, think, it's something that brings out to me the responsibility of a father. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. So Elisha is the servant of Elisha. He's a young man that is Elijah's apprentice, you could say. He's supposed to, God asked Elijah to anoint this young man to be a prophet in his stead. And he's leading Elisha as a prophet. Now, now look what... When the fiery chariot comes and takes Elijah to heaven, this is what Elisha says. Verse 11. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and a horse of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah and fell from him, and he went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Say, say what is that? Elijah was like a father to Elisha. He was close. What? What was he? He was his spiritual guide that taught him to be a man of God. Then Elijah was the man of God. Next, Elisha was the man of God. It was a young man that Elijah influenced the right way. Now, let me ask you, have you influenced some young man to be the man of God? God's man? We need more men in this country that are God's men. They're, they're, they're not... Satan's men, they're not worldly men, they're God's men. They're men of God, okay? Uh, they don't have to necessarily be the preacher or the pastor. They don't even have to be the deacon. You know what? Every man that's a child of God should be God's man. Amen. You're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, your soul, and your spirit. You ought to be God's man. And we ought to show our children how to be God's men. He, he was an example to him. 1 Kings 15, 3, I'll read it to you again. He walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord. Say, so what's perfect mean? Well, that doesn't mean that David was sinless. It means his heart was totally perfected toward following the Lord. 
He was doing it with all his might. Everything he had. God was first in his life. And there's no man outside Jesus Christ that lived a perfect life. Amen? But let me tell you, does God have your whole heart? Does your children see that? Are you God's man? Are you giving wholly over to Him? Number four, we all be the example of a man with the right kind of heart of love. It's one thing to be a soldier, but as Christians, we need to season that with a right attitude of love. I mean, I understand picking up the sword of the Spirit, but that is not to go out and to hack people in pieces as a barbarian. It's to promote that Jesus Christ loved them, died for them, and that we should show grace and love to all men. The Bible tells us to love our enemies. That doesn't come natural. You have to be taught to do that. You have to be shown how to do that. And Jesus Christ gives that example on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What's he doing? He's praying for his enemies. Don't you realize you were an enemy of God before you got saved? The Bible doesn't say you were a child of God. All, we're all the children of God. No, that's not biblical. You were actually an enemy of God before you became a child of God. For as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Say, so we're all the children of God. No, you're not. You're a child of the devil. You're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. When you're lost without Jesus Christ, you're a child of the devil. And no wonder you act like your father, like father, like son. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it. I hate to say it. You need to switch fathers. You need to get a good father, Jesus Christ. Okay? Amen. Amen. Uh, that, that, that's stepping from light to darkness. Have you ever received Jesus Christ as your Savior? need to be an example of the right kind of heart of love. In John 15, 9, 9, it says, that the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. And John 15, 12, it says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Let me ask you something. If your children watch you, do they see an example of the right kind of love? I'll tell you, my dad was a good example of a man that loved his wife the right way. I thank God for that. I know a lot of people don't get that example. A lot of people don't have that right example that's set before them. That helps children. You know, one of the biggest problems in our society right now is men never long taught their children the value of loving their spouses why your divorce rate is out the roof. All these children come from broken homes. They don't know how to conduct themselves in a marriage. And no wonder their marriage doesn't work. They, they haven't been given that example. Society doesn't show the right example of the sacrificial love that one should give. The one putting someone else first over yourself. Say, well, that's not easy to do. No, it's not. Your, your, your flesh always wants to be number one. And that's not the cry, kind of love that Christ gave. As we were teaching in Sunday school with him, washing his disciples' feet, he put himself down, put them first. That's real love. Real love is loving someone enough to die for them. Christ died for us, when we were enemies, when we were ungodly, unlovable, he died for us, gave himself for us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet, was his enemies, 
while we're yet enemies, Christ died for us. Is, is that right? Huh? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's later in the passage he calls us enemies. That's uh, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. But uh, he, he loved us. That, that shows a love that's not natural. Not natural. How many of them Ukrainians would die for the Russians? Not for the Ukrainians, but for the Russians. Boy, that would be unnatural. That, that, that wouldn't be normal. You know, that's what Christ did. That's what Christ did. I want every head bowed and every eye closed for a minute. Like father, like son. When you got saved, you became a child of God. God as a father is a perfect father. There's no heir with him. Behold the man, man Christ Jesus. For us young men, the apex of what a man should be was in Jesus Christ. That, that's, you can't find a better role model as a man than Jesus Christ. Behold the man. Jesus Christ never picked up a sword, an Uzi, or a machine gun. But he was a man. He did pick up a whip. <laughs> but, uh, but he was a man. He was a man. He gave you an example of a man. He was a man that never sinned. Great example of what's right and what's wrong. Pharisees sinned all the time. They were, just because you're, they're a religious leader don't mean they're a great example of what's right and what's wrong. But he, he gave the example of what's right and what's wrong. Do we do that as fathers? He gave a great example of being a man of God. Obviously, he was God in the flesh. And also, he gave a great example of the right kind of love. Not this perverted, twisted stuff the world promotes. But true love where you put someone above yourself how about us as fathers do we try to do that for our children do we try to do those before around us I challenge every father today to take these aspects and set an example for those that are below us that God has put in our lives whether it's our children maybe it's some young man at work Maybe it's a neighbor's child. You know, some people may, you may influence them. You may be the only father they know. I've heard people when they talk about someone, they says, well, this man, he influenced me more in my life than any other man. He was more of a father to me than my own father. I, I've heard guys say that all the time. I can't say that. I had a good father. And my father was a good example. But some people, I mean... You might be the only father they know. And they're not actually your children. Not actually your children. Do you influence some young man that right? Do you set the example? Do you set their bar high to achieve? Do you give them a high standard? We need more of that in this country. We need more of that. All right, let's have a song of invitation.